Hi everyone, welcome to the next section, Evaluation and Validation. In this section, we will first evaluate how our model is performing. Then we will ensure that our model generalizes to data in validation. Now we move on to the first video of this section that deals with evaluation. In this video, we are going to evaluate how our models are performing. As you can see, there are a lot of decisions to make around how we evaluate our models. What really matters is the context. In some cases, efficiency definitely matters, but every machine learning context requires us to measure how our predictions, inferences, or results match the ideal predictions, inferences, or results. Thus, measuring this comparison between computed results and ideal results should always take priority over speed optimizations. Generally, there are some types of results that we will need to evaluate. The first one is continuous. These are the results such as total sales, stock price, and temperature that can take any continuous numerical value. The next one is categorical. These are the results such as fraud, not fraud, activity, and name that can take one of a finite number of categories. We will look at continuous metrics. Let's say that we have a model that is supposed to predict some continuous value, like stock price. Here we have accumulated some predicted values that we can compare to actual observed values. Now, how do we measure the performance of this model? Well, the first step would be taking the difference between the observed and predicted values to get an error. The error gives us a general idea of how far off we were from the value that we were supposed to predict. However, it's not really feasible or practical to look at all the error values individually, especially when there is a lot of data. There could be a million or more of these error values, thus we need a way to understand the errors in aggregate. The mean squared error, MSE, and mean absolute error, MAE, provide us with a view on errors in aggregate. MSD, or mean squared deviation, is the average of the squares of all the errors. MAE is the average of the absolute values of all the errors. Both MSE and MAE give us a good overall picture of how good our predictions are, but they do have differences. As the MSE takes the square of the errors, large error values are emphasized more than in MAE. In other words, MSE is more sensitive to outliers. MAE, on the other hand, maintains the same units as the variable that we are trying to predict and is thus directly comparable to these values. For this dataset, we can parse the observed and predicted values and calculate the MAE and MSE using this code. Here we first open the continuous observations and predictions, then we have created a new CSV reader. These two lines are used to hold the past observed and predicted values. Then we track row numbers for logging and read the records for unexpected types in columns. We read in a row and check if we are at the end of the file. Then we skip the header and read the observed and predicted values. If it has the expected type, we append the record to slice. Finally, we calculate mean absolute error and mean squared error and then output the result. Let's check the result in our terminal. We build it. We get MAE as 2.55 and MSE as 10.51. To judge if these are good values or not, we need to compare them to the values in our observed data. In particular, the MAE is 2.55 and the mean of our observed values is 14.0, so our MAE is about 20% of our mean value. This is not very good, depending on the context. Along with the MSE and MAE, you will likely see R squared, also known as R2, or the coefficient of determination, used as an evaluation metric for continuous variable models. R squared also gives us a general idea about the deviations of our predictions, but the idea of R squared is slightly different. R squared measures the proportion of the variance in the observed value that we capture in the predicted values. Remember that the values that we are trying to predict have some variability. For example, we might be trying to predict stock prices, interest rates, or disease progressions, which by their very nature aren't all the same. We are attempting to create a model that can predict this variability in the observed values, and the percentage of the variation that we capture is represented by R squared. Conveniently, forward slash go num forward slash stat 
has a built-in function to calculate R squared. So let's go to the next example. Here we have the go num. This is the code to calculate R raised to two value and print the result. Running code for our example dataset results in this output. So is this a good or bad R squared? Remember that R squared is a percentage and higher percentages are better. Here we are capturing about 37% of the variance in the variable that we are trying to predict, and this is not very good. Categorical metrics. Let's say we have a model that is supposed to predict some discrete value such as fraud, not fraud, standing, sitting, walking, approved, not approved, and so on. Our data might look something like this. The observed values could take any one of a finite number of values, in this case, one, two, or three. Each of these values represents one of the discrete categories in our data. Class 1 might correspond to a fraudulent transaction. Class 2 might correspond to a transaction that is not fraudulent. And Class 3 might correspond to an invalid transaction, for example. The predicted values could also take one of these discrete values. In evaluating our predictions, we want to somehow measure how right we were in making those discrete predictions. Individual Evaluation Metrics for Categorical Variables Actually, there are a huge number of ways to evaluate discrete predictions with metrics, including accuracy, precision, recall, specificity, sensitivity, fallout, false omission rate, and many more. As with continuous variables, there is no one-size-fits-all metric for evaluation. Each time you approach a problem, you need to determine the metric that fits the problem and matches the goals of the project. You don't want to optimize for the wrong things and then waste a bunch of time re-implementing your model based on other metrics. To understand these metrics and determine which is appropriate for our use case, we need to realize that there are a number of different scenarios that could occur when we are making discrete predictions. True positive, TP. We predicted a certain category and the observation was actually that category. For example, we predicted fraud and the observation was fraud. False positive, FP. We predicted a certain category, but the observation was actually another category. For example, we predicted fraud, but the observation was not fraud. True negative, TN. We predicted that the observation wasn't a certain category, and the observation was not that category. For example, we predicted not fraud, and the observation was not fraud. False negative, FN. We predicted that the observation wasn't a certain category, but the observation was actually that category. For example, we predicted not fraud, but the observation was fraud. However, there are some pretty standard ways of aggregating and measuring these scenarios that result in the following common metrics. Accuracy, the percentage of predictions that were right. Precision, the percentage of positive predictions that were actually positive. Recall the percentage of positive predictions that were identified as positive. We will look at an example that passes our data and calculates accuracy. First, we read in our labeled.csv file, create a CSV reader, then we hold the past, observed, and predicted values, track row numbers for logging, and initialize two slices that will hold our past, observed, and predicted values. Then we will iterate over the records in the CSV parsing the values, and we will compare the observed and predicted values. Moving on, we read in the observed and predicted values. Then we append the record to our slice. Then accumulate the true, positive, negative count and calculate the accuracy. Running this results in 97% accuracy. That means we were right 97% of the time. We can similarly calculate precision and recall. However, you may have noticed that there are a couple of ways we can do this when we have more than two categories or classes. We could consider class 1 as positive and the other classes as negative, class 2 as positive and the other classes as negative, and so on. That is, we could calculate a precision or recall for each of our classes as shown in this code sample. The previous part of the code remains the same. Here, classes contains the three possible classes in the labeled data, and we loop over each class. These variables will hold our count of true positives and our count of false positives. We accumulate the true positive and false positive counts. If the observed value is the relevant class, 
we should check to see if we predicted that class. And if the observed value is a different class, we should check to see if we predicted a false positive. Finally, we calculate precision and calculate recall. This code is used to output the precision value. When we run this code, we get the precision and recall of class 0, 1, and 2. Notice that the precision and recall are slightly different metrics and have different implications. If we wanted to get an overall precision or recall, we could average the per-class precisions and recalls. In fact, if certain classes were more important than other classes, we could take a weighted average of these and use that as our evaluation metric. You can see that a couple of the metrics are 100%. This seems good, but it might actually indicate a problem, as we will further discuss. Now we will learn confusion matrices, AUC and ROC. In addition to calculating individual numerical metrics for our models, there are a variety of techniques to combine various metrics into a form that gives you a more complete representation of model performance. These include, but are certainly not limited to, confusion matrices and area under curve, AUC, receiver operating characteristic, ROC curves. Confusion matrices allow us to visualize the various TP, TN, FP, and FN values that we predict in a two-dimensional format. A confusion matrix has rows corresponding to the categories that you were supposed to predict and columns corresponding to categories that were predicted. Then the value of each element is the corresponding count. As you can see, the ideal situation is that your confusion matrix only has entries on the diagonal TP, TN. The diagonal elements represent predicting a certain category and the observation actually being in that category. The off-diagonal elements include counts for predictions that were incorrect. This type of confusion matrix can be especially useful for problems that have more than two categories. In addition to confusion matrices, ROC curves are commonly used to get an overall picture of the performance of binary classifiers, or models that are trained to predict one of two categories. ROC curves plot the recall versus false positive rate, FP, over FP plus TN, for every possible classification threshold. The thresholds used in an ROC curve represent various boundaries or rankings in which you are separating the two categories of your classification. That is, the model that is evaluated by the ROC curve must make a prediction for the two classes based on probability, ranking, or score. In every example mentioned earlier, a score is classified one way and vice versa. To generate an ROC curve, we plot a point for each score or rank in our testing example. We can then connect these to form a curve. In many cases, you will see a straight line plotted down the diagonal of the ROC curve plot. This straight line is a reference line for a classifier with approximately random predictive power. A good ROC curve is one that is in the upper left section of the plot, which means that our model has better than random predictive power. The more that the ROC curve hugs the upper left-hand side of the plot, the better. This means that good ROC curves have more AUC. AUC for ROC curves is also used as an evaluation metric. We will now look at an example. The GONAM stat has some built-in functions and types that help you build ROC curves and AUC metrics. Here is a quick example that calculates the AUC for an ROC curve with GONUM. We first define our scores and classes, then we calculate the true positive rates, recalls, and false positive rates. Then we compute the area under curve. Finally, we add this code for getting the result. Running this code results in such an output, where we get the positive rates and AUC.